and let's kick things started. Uh, all right. Uh, hi, everyone. First of all, welcome everybody uh, joining us today to the Future of Food Series Seeking Sustainability Solution event number three in conversation with George Monbiot. Uh, this event is organized by the Department of Public and International Affairs, City University of Hong Kong, where I am a student of. I'm the MC of today, and once again, welcome everybody to this amazing, wonderful event. So in case you don't already know, George is one of the sharpest voice in on the deterioration of global environment and how to confront this disturbing change. His latest thinking has come together in a new book titled Regenesis, Feeding the World Without Devouring the Planet. We're very delighted that George is with us, uh, joining us today. We have three parts for you in this event. First, Hong Kong's dynamic plant-based leader and thinker, Sonali of Greenquin, will have a conversation with George. Then six students would like to ask George some questions Finally, we have some time for the general Q and A's with the audience. So please remember, if you have any questions or, or comments, uh, put it in the chat box first. So without further ado, are you guys ready? Let me hand the floor over to Sonali. Thank you so much, Tony. What an amazing intro and George, welcome. What an honor, such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for making time. Um, I'm gonna dive right in. Today, uh, we are here to talk about your new book, Regenesis. It's your 12th book, I believe. Um, what was the main thesis for writing this book, given you've written so many others? I believe you're muted, George. Yeah, sorry. sorry. That, oh, thank okay. you. Great. Thanks, Sonali. Yes, it does seem a bit greedy to, to write so <laughs> many books, but um, I've been puzzling over this question for a long time as, as to why it is that we apply you know, relatively strict standards to all industries except food and farming and we create a sort of moral force field around those industries and say oh no we don't want to criticize them we don't want to go there and yet food production is by a very long way the most damaging thing we are doing to the planet we all need food we all need farming we all need to eat but the way we're doing it is absolutely devastating to life on Earth and to our own future prospects. It's the number one cause of habitat destruction, the number one cause of wildlife loss, the number one cause of species extinction, the number one cause of, uh, cause of soil depletion, of fresh water use. Most importantly, perhaps, and we always neglect this, of land use. And it's also one of the major causes of greenhouse gas emissions of water pollution and of air pollution and yet we we don't want to criticize it and we don't even want really to document what it's doing let alone find much better ways of doing it, it it's it's as if we just shy away from the issue except for a few tiny little tweaks around the margins which just aren't going to get there so this huge central question how do we feed the world without devouring the planet that came to devour my mind and to really dominate my thinking and my questioning over quite a few years and so finally I thought right I've just got to try to crack this no, I can't avoid it any longer because so many people have been avoiding it I've got to tackle it head on and that led me into a really fascinating and quite mind-blowing intellectual adventure um, because, because so little of, of this issue is, is known uh, outside very narrow scientific circles. Um, and almost every day I was coming across things which made me go, wow, that changes everything that is absolutely fascinating why doesn't everyone know this why isn't this on on you know the top of the political agenda and this was day after day after day and altogether as well as doing extensive field work I read 5,000 scientific papers in in wow. researching this book I just couldn't stop I became addicted to to, to, to reading them to chasing the citations trail and go, going on and on and on to discover these extraordinary things, which specialists know, but the rest of us don't, and we urgently need to. Well, it's become a bit of an obsession for myself, so I understand very much what you what you mean. Um, 
you have been sounding the alarm about climate and food for a long time now. I actually found some of your columns from almost from five years ago. I even found a Guardian column or article sound, making the connection between climate and food um, from 2009. So let me ask you, um, in the last couple of years, do you see a difference in the fact of whether people are starting to make a connection between food and climate? Do you think it's changing? Or do you think still most people just don't know? I, I think most people don't know, but I think it is also changing. I think we're beginning to see the beginnings of the shift. We're, we're starting to see some people uh, becoming much more aware than they were before. And that is beginning to ripple outwards. It's much too slow. It's, it's, I find so many times I'm having to start from first base with people to say, right, OK, this is the problem. Yeah, and yet, you know, what we're looking at is an even bigger issue than fossil fuels. You know, we've finally got there with fossil fuels. You know, it's taken 30 years or so to persuade people that fossil fuels are a problem and to explain why fossil fuels are a problem. Still, some people deny it. Well, of course they do. But, but you know, we've broadly got there. Most people are at least vaguely aware that fossil fuels are a problem and why they're a problem. But, but the food system, yeah, it's it. You'd have to start from scratch again and again and again, and it's frustrating. But you know that's what educators are here to do. So, do you think the media is doing a good enough job on that front, other than folks like yourself, just in general? The media is not doing a good enough job on any front. I mean, the media is. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you wrote a column this morning. Um, that was very interesting. I really liked your question. So if you don't like the new technologies, what solution do you propose? And let's get to the new technology soon. But one of the things that we're seeing as people in the industry is an increasing attacks of meat and dairy lobbies on, you know, solutions and alternatives to our addiction to industrial meat. Um, how do we as citizens, how do we deal with this, given that most people are not even aware that lobbies are in play? Yeah. So so I, I feel like I've been here before because I've been fighting the fossil fuel industry for so long and they've been using exactly the same tactics. And, and in fact, they learned those tactics from the tobacco industry. In fact, some of the very same people who did the job for the tobacco industry went on to do the job for for the fossil fuel industry. And it's probably the same people, the same public relations Involved advisors in, right. yeah, who, who, are, who are doing the same job for the livestock industry. And they find... They're, they're clever people they know how to get into your mind they know they know what persuades people and what doesn't and so they just find all these ways of of trying to keep people hooked on the current economy the current meat-based economy and to demonize any attempts to address that and and I think you've just got to realize this is the sea in which we swim you know it, it's it's pointless even really to complain about it you know this it's just these these are our circumstances. We are up against massive industrial lobbies who will fight with every dirty trick in the book to try to sustain their position and prevent themselves from being outcompeted. Yeah, you know, and and in the past, some of these lobbies have been successful. It's like how the motor industry and the oil industry nixed electric cars. You know, going back a century now. You know, they just stopped the development of electric cars. Well, we can't afford to let that happen, and so we have. To fight them and and we fight them by making the case again and again and by making it as well as we can and as creatively as we can we we use the facts we use the data the scientific figures which are now very well established and we get them out there it's not enough just to reel off facts and figures we have to embed them within narratives within the stories which which are going to reach people and we sure. have to be as clever and creative as possible in doing so Sure, sure. But one of the more worrying things that, that we're seeing is also that, for example, vegan advocates are joining forces with pro-pasture beef yeah. regenerative ag advocates, right? Yeah. It makes for very strange bedfellows, but this is happening. Um, where do you see that going? How, how do you sure. find so, that? Yeah, no, it, 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 is, it's, it is peculiar and disturbing, but we've seen it before. Um, okay. and, and all too often, People who see themselves as environmentalists are actually defending the old against the new, regardless of what the environmental impact of that is. So to give, give you an example in another sector, 
I know several people who refuse to have a microwave oven in their house, right, because they think it's going to kill them. Now, there's no evidence whatsoever that a microwave oven harms you. But the very same people in every case have a wood burning stove in their house, which absolutely can kill you because of the very dangerous particulate emissions that it creates. But they think the wood burning stove is green and the microwave oven is not because the wood burning stove is old and the microwave oven is new. And often what 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 we've got is a phobia of new stuff um and 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 a sort of almost a sort of comfort reaction i've got to cling on to the old stuff and this is why you see this bizarre situation of environmentalists supporting pasture fed meat which is the most damaging farm product on earth that is what has destroyed more rainforests more wetlands more savannas more habitat in general than any other food product is what's driven more indigenous people off their land than any other food product is what produces more greenhouse gas emissions than any other food product it has the biggest carbon and ecological opportunity costs of any product but it's old very very old it goes back to the neolithic you know people were herding cattle 10,000 years ago and so it's good old is good and and the very same people will attack anyone who's trying to produce um, plant-based or microbial based meat substitutes to to appeal to people who aren't going to go vegan but want to eat something like meat um, but actually it doesn't come from animals and and because that's new oh it's scary it's new and and you know what what if you know it'll be made in factories well so it all the food we eat just about passes through a factory before it reaches us, you know. There's and so there are these sort of these sort of scare words like factories. Mm -hmm. Ah, factories. Yeah, where do you think your food comes from? You know, where, sure. you know, yes, you know, it might be grown in fields, fine, great, but it'll pass through a factory before it reaches you, even if it's just to package it, it will go through a factory. And if yeah, there's a certain extremes of a certain exception. type of elitism that is that is yeah. that is really dangerous. But let's dive into the alternative technologies. You've been tasting, sampling some of them. Um, you know, do you feel most people are aware of the the many alternative protein technologies from cultivated meat to microbial fermentation and precision fermentation to plant based you know meats 2.0 beyond the the you know the seitan and the tempeh? What what is your view? Um, are we are we having an effect in terms of getting the word out and and how what made you get behind these technologies because you know you wrote a, an impassioned um, post uh, around the reboot movement so would love to hear more uh, and you had a great piece in the New York Times around precision fermentation um, and it was interesting to see you embrace this technology um, so I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah so so I mean, I think with the new food technologies, we're at the bottom of the S curve. Now, all successful new technologies, whether it's the laptop I'm speaking on to, to you, whether it's this, um, whether it's you know the refrigerator, whether it was a car replacing horses and carts, they all follow this S curve adoption. And so for quite a few years, they bump along the bottom and not much seems to be happening and they have various setbacks and um, and people say, oh, the, the sector's collapsing, you know, there's not much going on. And you know, uptake yeah. <laughs> is just one or two percent. Um, mm. And so you see big fluctuations because you have a low baseline. Um, and then what happens is the price starts to come down, the scale starts to go up, the quality starts to improve. This has been the case with all of these technologies, you know, even like artificial ice as opposed to river ice, you know, it, 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 all, the transition has always been the same and there's always been scare stories around the new technologies. And so it bumps along the bottom, bumps along the bottom, and then it begins slightly to uptick and you'll see a sort of slow rise to about 10% uh, market penetration. And then it just goes straight up like that it's slow then sudden and that's the s curve adoption and, and we see that again and again and again electric light bulbs you know all, all the way through history we, sure. we we see that that adoption curve so at the moment we're, we're still at the bottom of the s curve 
for new technologies like precision fermentation, like um, realistic alternative meats made out of plant or microbial products, for instance, um, cell cultured meat and the rest of it. You know, I think the answer is going to be a hybrid of all three, incidentally. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're, we're right at the beginning of this. And most people either don't even know about it or like say, oh, no, that's not for me. You know, I don't see myself as the sort of person who, who, who might eat those things. And that's that's totally familiar from the whole history of industrial change that that's how it's always been and what we've seen happening in the last few months suggests that we're beginning to move into the second phase of the s curve which is off the bottom and just starting to climb and and that's been several quite dramatic breakthroughs what one has been um um the first approvals for cell cultured meat in singapore and and in the us um Another has has been the radically improved quality of plant based meat substitutes. Now, look, I'm I'm plant based. I don't feel any need to eat meat substitutes, but these aren't aimed at me, and they're not aimed right. at you. you know, they're aimed at the great majority of people who want to eat something like meat. Um, and I've eaten um, uh, recently three sets of products which are quite mind blowingly similar. To, to what they're imitating so so much so that you, you know if it were a blind tasting you really would not know the difference what one is a steak made by a slovenian company called juicy marbles yeah um one is um a, a lamb lamb fillet and beef fillet made by a, an israeli company called um a, a, a redefined meat and the other is is a whole series of sushi and um tempura products um, made by um, a restaurant in London called 123V. And in every case, it's like, oh, I can't believe I'm not eating the original. In fact, it's quite disturbing for, 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 for someone who's part <laughs> of me to hear, oh, this doesn't feel right. <laughs> so, so I think we're seeing these very major breakthroughs. We're going to see the cost come down, a lot more competition coming in. Um, the cost will start coming down. And as that happens, adoption will start to tick up. Um, People are, um, in the industry are saying we're likely to reach cost parity about the middle of this decade, but then the takeoff and the S curve will be in the 2030s. That's that's what they that's what they reckon. Do you think we can get there without government intervention? Well, in the we, do of need, we do need some meat? government action. A lot of the time it, it's about government getting out of the way um, because we have governments responding to lobby groups by saying right. oh you can't call it milk you can't call it cheese you can't call it meat or sausages or burgers unless it's come from an animal which right. which is sort of slightly confusing because there's a whole load of products which you know they're, they're perfectly happy with this food literal not for food literalism not to apply what about peanut butter what about sure. coconut what about jelly babies are they babies? <laughs> what about buffalo wings? Do buffaloes have wings? <laughs> Turkey dinosaurs. Are there, is there any dinosaur in them? Hot dogs. You know, if you're going to ban <laughs> vegan hot dogs on the basis that they don't have any meat in them, why don't you ban the meat hot dogs on the basis that they don't have any dog in them? It's, you know, so, so this, this, you know, this, this is just some bullshit responses to industrial lobbying. But unfortunately, a lot of governments are responsive to that lobbying. Um, uh, there's there are the regulatory issue is really the big sticking point in Europe and in the UK in the UK our, our food regulator like everything else in the UK is is underfunded and overwhelmed um, and and just can't cope with the volume of applications mostly for um, cannabidiol C CBD applications it's just been completely flooded with them and it can't get through those to get to the alternative protein uh, right. applications and in the EU, there's this regulatory process which, where it's meant to take two years for a novel food application um, to get adopted, uh, but that process can be suspended at any time. And so the um, so what you've got is 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 industrial lobbyists, the agriculture, the, the the animal agriculture lobby putting huge pressure on the regulators by bombarding them with lots of objections. And then they say, oh, it's too complicated. We'll just suspend the process. And then it stays in limbo uh, for years, potentially. And so these products can't then get adopted and they can't reach the people who want to eat them.
Yeah, so that might slow things down. Well, I'm going to pass it to the students. I have one last question, and you can keep it brief. This is going to be a complete shift, but um, as we're increasingly seeing people uh, struggling with mental health issues, um, and we're increasingly seeing an upcoming generation of who, who are going to ask you questions of, of basically very climate aware, climate anxious, uh, um, you know, Gen Zers, um, how do you find the inspiration and strength to continue amidst attacks and, you know, lack of good news and lack of progress, you know, where is your hope? Yeah, so it, it is exhausting and difficult, uh, you know, and, and, and it is, it is a struggle. It is a constant struggle. I've been doing this for 38 years now, but I draw inspiration, particularly from the young people who are stepping forward, you know, the amazingly brave people who are often prepared to risk prison um, in order to defend the living world and defend the, the, the prospects of their own generations. Um, I draw inspiration also from the knowledge that things can change very, very quickly. Mm. Now, society is a complex system and all complex systems have tipping points. And with society, we, we know pretty well where the tipping point is. It's about 25% of people dedicated to a new approach. Once you can reach 25% of the population and persuade them to get behind a new idea, then that change becomes very hard to stop. And the reason for that is partly the internal dynamics of a complex system called society, but partly that we are the hyper-social mammals and we're always testing the wind to see which way it's blowing. And if we perceive that the wind has changed, we swing round to, to catch that wind. And so the great majority of people never need to be persuaded. They just need to feel that things have changed and they'll fall into line with that change. Now, of course, highly repressive and authoritarian governments can stamp out that change. But in any government which at least pretends to be a democracy, it's very hard for them to stop it. And so what we can see is a situation which seems hopeless. We feel, oh, you know, we, we can't get anywhere. We we'll go on forever fighting people one by one. But actually, it, it, we're not taking into account the dynamics of complex systems and how they operate. And, and so I think that above all else gives me hope that things can move much, much faster than we imagine possible. Thank you so much. A wonderful message of hope. Over to you, Tony. Thanks, George. Thanks, Anali, for the absolutely amazing, insightful, and great sense of humor, by the way, uh, uh, sharings. So speaking of the younger generation who are the, the impact makers, uh, we today have some students from around the world joining us. So our first student question takes us to Melbourne, uh, and a student leader at the University of Melbourne in food space, Chad Cha, has a question for George. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the interview. It was really interesting. Um, I just wanted to know your thoughts around, I guess, the messaging around like environmental change, I guess. So like when I was younger, a lot of the messaging, at least from what I remember, was reduce, reuse and recycle. Whereas now um, a lot of the focus is on carbon emissions and like how much carbon offset and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I guess I wanted your thoughts, like in general, over like why the messaging's changed, but also um, in context of like the food system. So like I know the book focuses on food production, but I was thinking about like food waste and afterwards mm. and how that contributes to um, the emergency crisis. So Thank you very much, Tech. So, so I think I think it's fair to say there's two questions there. What one about the general issue of messaging and one about food waste. And so I'll I'll tackle them separately if I if I can if that's okay. So first of all. I think there has been a problem with, with our messaging for a long, long time, across decades, really, where we've tended to sort of latch on to one issue in isolation and say, this is the issue that everyone should be concerned about and ignore the other issues. And sometimes the result of that is to actually make the other issues worse. So, for instance, with the sort of sole focus on greenhouse gas emissions, we have perverse policies like here in the UK, for, for example, where they say, right, we'll just swap all the internal combustion engine cars for electric cars. And then we we'll solve the problem because there'll be far few, fewer greenhouse gas emissions. And that's true. There will be. 
but there's still an enormous resource use required to manufacture all those cars. There's still all the roads, all the traffic jams, all the dysfunctions of our current transport system, all the people excluded from that transport system because they can't drive a, a, a private car, um, all the brake dust, all the tire dust, which are still major pollutants, all that's still there. Whereas if we were to take a more holistic approach, we would say, right, we've got a transport issue here. In fact, it's not just a transport issue, it's a town planning issue as well. And so we have to try to deal with the whole thing rather than just look at one aspect, which is the greenhouse gas emissions, which the cars might be producing. So we say, well, the first thing we should do is to design things so that people don't have to travel so much. And for instance, a 15 minute city being proposed by uh, or pursued by Anne, Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, is, is a good example of that, uh, where everything's within walking distance. And and then um, we say, well, for, for more than that, let's prioritize bicycles, for example, which, uh, you know, by creating dedicated safe road space for bicycles where, you know, you're not going to be run over by a car when you're cycling. And and then for people who either can't cycle or for longer distances we bring in electrified public transport um so um electric buses or or monorails or trams or whatever the most appropriate one may be and then only the residue of the problem it involves changing your cars you have you greatly reduce the number of cars required um, and and some people you know, have to drive cars because of their health issues or because they're working night shifts or whatever it might be. They don't have a choice, but you make sure those ones are electric. And, and in doing that, you solve about half a dozen problems all at the same time, rather than just this end of the pipe solution, which the electric car is. Um, and, and what I want to see happening is these holistic approaches taken right across the board, where instead of just saying, you know, it's about your carbon footprint, you say, well, yeah, it's also about the amount of infrastructure we're using. It's also about the amount of resources. It's also about social exclusion, you know, and who gets to travel and who doesn't travel. And it's about the, the, the horrible situation where some people have to travel hours every day to do their work, but don't want to. They don't want to be commuting that way. So how do we address that? And you can start looking at all of these problems at the same time, which is so much more constructive. And, and so, you know, the reason I'm emphasizing food is not at the exclusion of other problems. It's not to say, let's stop worrying about these other problems, but because we haven't integrated food into the rest of our worldview because we've created a moral force field around it and sort of shunted it out of our minds we're missing a huge part of the picture which should be absolutely integral to it now on your second question food waste um we're all against waste of course we are you know and we need to minimize waste that should ring an alarm bell when 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 an issue is something which anyone can anyone can subscribe to without any moral difficulty or political difficulty at all you start to ask mm, is this as big an issue as it's made out to be so a similar one with litter you know that, that everyone hates litter um and anyone can stand up and say yes i'm against litter it doesn't cost them anything to do that and in fact the anti-litter campaign um, which went worldwide, was originally set up by the US Association of Packaging Manufacturers, who were trying to unload the political responsibility to deal with their own products off themselves and onto consumers. Um, and, and they invented the term litter bug and they, did, they sponsored all these videos about terrible people dropping litter because that way you transfer the, the blame. And there's something similar being going on with food waste. Now, Food waste is a real problem. Um, we, we, we waste roughly around a third of all the food we produce worldwide. Um, it's not nearly as big a problem as some other issues, such as animal farming, which is massively more wasteful. And it's also very, very hard to address beyond a certain point. So in the UK, we've got a brilliant company called Fair Share, or a company charity called Fair Share, which has um, um, persuaded um, all the supermarkets, manufacturers, farmers who can possibly re-channel their waste to to do so, and then that um, all that food then is 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 sent is delivered to food banks and to community groups and and reused. And we're pretty well 
hit the bottom of 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 the re reuse of of food waste but that's only about an eighth of the food that is wasted in this country and the reason you can't use the rest is is that it's at the wrong stage of the manufacturing process it would have to be manufactured further you know you can take surplus vegetables straight off the farm but what do you do about surplus grain if there's no market for it um what do you do about grain that's gone moldy what do you do about a herd of pigs when there's swine flu and nobody what you know there's a whole lot of things where it's just almost impossible to intervene and in rich nations like mine in the uk the majority of food waste is post-consumer so it's your half-eaten meals that you chuck in the compost bin. Now, those can't be brought back into the system. Who's going to want to eat those? You know, and it's much better that they go for composting. Um, and and so, so a lot of the time we say, oh, food waste. Food waste is a big issue because nobody disagrees with that. When nobody disagrees with someone, with, 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 with something, that's when we should start to question that thing and wonder if it really is the big issue and the big intervention point. And there was a study in The Lancet which showed that um, if looking at it from the perspective of greenhouse gas emissions, the maximum reduction of food waste would reduce your greenhouse gas emissions by 5%. But if people um, um, went from an animal-based to a plant-based diet, it would reduce it by 80%. So given that moral suasion is a limited resource, I would emphasize the latter rather than the former. Well, thanks. So it was really great. Thank you, Tay. Thanks. Uh, so moving from Australia back to Hong Kong for our second question. And a master's student from City University of Hong Kong, Che To Long Yet Tony. Another Tony, please take over. Hello. Time. Yeah, so my first question is about do you think that the genetic engineering corps can be an effective way to counter the water pollution or extreme weather come from the uh, climate change or global warming, or is actually a little bit cost to doing that? And my second question is, even though artificial meat seems like pretty good, but why it is not that popular right now, is there anything is actually hindering the usage or practice of artificial meat? So thank you, that's my question. Thank you very much, Tony. Two very good questions. So I, I think my answer to genetic modification or genetic engineering or indeed gene editing is, is to say we, we address it case by case. You know, to, to say the technology itself is a problem, I think would be wrong. Um, the technology can be used in bad ways. And, and the, the initial way in which they tried to roll it out in Europe was with Monsanto's Roundup Ready cattle feed crops. Uh, which brought no benefit to people whatsoever, uh, but would increase the use of their Roundup herbicide um, uh, and therefore um, damaging even more wildlife than before. And so people, including myself, opposed that. Um, we, we, it was going to allow Monsanto to get even more corporate power. Um, there was no benefit at all to human beings or to the natural world. But there are plenty of applications of genetic modification which do bring benefits. Um, and in fact, in precision fermentation, breeding microbes to produce proteins um, and um, uh, and fats, uh, you, you can um, uh, see some real leaps and bounds if you use gene editing or genetic modification there, because you can produce more or less the exact profile of animal proteins without any animals. And I think we're right at the beginning of a sort of unicellular revolution that uh, for the past 10,000 years, we've been breeding multicellular organisms and we've been selecting them and breeding them and doing horrible things to them, whether they're pigs or chickens, or of course plants, you know, we've been growing on a vast scale, uh, but we can massively shrink the footprint, particularly of protein production, if we use single celled organisms instead, bacteria, yeasts, for example, archaea, um, there, there, there's there's a whole range of potential candidates um, and you're basically brewing those organisms to produce proteins which are effectively exactly the same as animal proteins and fish proteins and the rest of it um, and that's much more efficient um, and much massively lower environmental impacts and can be done anyway you don't need fertile land you, you don't need um, um, good water supplies, um, so it can have a huge impact also on food security. Um, so, um, 
So I, I think the issues with, with genetic modification are the same issues as with really any agricultural or food technology, which is who owns it? You know, where's the control? What we don't want is massive corporate control of the food chain. Now, we've already got that. Um, for instance, four corporations control 90% of the global grain trade. Uh, but the answer is not to ban the global grain trade, because if that happened, billions would starve. The answer is good antitrust laws to break up those corporations. Um, and, and the same should apply with, 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 with the new food technologies, I think, as well. Um, oh, I've forgotten your second question. Could, could you just say it again? Sorry, Tony. Um, <clears throat> so my second question is, like, why artificial meat is not that popular right now? Oh, because yes. It's, yes, it seems like pretty good. Yeah. OK, th thank you very much. I, I think the answer is that um, the good artificial meat is still very expensive. So um, so in um, here in Europe, um, the the only ones I've eaten have been in sort of fairly high end restaurants. They're not um, the good stuff isn't yet available in the shops. Um, it costs. Yeah, it does cost quite a lot. You know, the, uh, a meal with that at the center is probably about 30 pounds or so, you know, about, about $30, which which is a lot of money. Um, but that's at the beginning of the S curve, you know, so so the price will come right down as the scale goes up. Um, and at the moment, unfortunately, most of the meat substitutes people are uh, exposed to aren't very good. And the danger is that they can put people off. People will say, oh, you know, I don't I, I, tr I tried a meat substitute. It was rubbish. I'm never eating another one. Whereas there's some really good stuff in, in, in the pipeline, um, but it's just too expensive for most people at the moment. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. George. And thanks, Tony, again. Uh, next up, we have a young climate activist, uh, Lance Lau, who from the age of 10 has been championing uh, climate action. Lance, please. Hello, George. So um, my question today is, apart from not eating meat, what can young people my age do to stop livestock farming? And how do we get people like myself to be involved? Thank you very much, Lance. And thank you so much for your, your work, which is exactly the sort of thing that gives me hope and, and faith. I'm very, very glad in, uh, about what you're doing. Um, so uh, we, what we're facing is this massive onslaught uh, by a legacy industry, uh, which will fight by all and any means to, to try to, to hold on to, to what it's got. And so you're quite right. It's not just a matter of changing our consumer choices. It's also a political struggle which needs to be had, just like our political struggle with the oil companies. And that means campaigning. That means um, creating very clear messages to explain to people what we're facing and why. I mean, I see you know all demonstrations, all effective demonstrations, as being demonstrations in two respects. You know, we're demonstrating against something, but we're also demonstrating something. We're showing people something that they haven't yet seen, and 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 it's the sort of unveiling of the issue, which is which is a huge part of our work as campaigners to to say to people, you might not be aware of this. But let me show you something which is absolutely crucial to life on Earth. And so explaining the impacts of, of, of livestock production, you know, which is the, the worst thing we're doing at all, because it's hitting every single Earth system, you know, all the way from rivers to land to rainforests to, to, um, to greenhouse gas emissions. It's just hammering all the Earth systems. Um, and and to also to explain this is what the livestock industry is telling you and this is its tactics this is what it's trying to do but this is a reality it's, it's not like it says these things are absolutely as essential to any effective campaign is is that explanatory role that campaigners have and then we also should be putting pressure on governments not to succumb to the lobbying of that industry and not to allow that industry to stop the development of new products. And um, we should be asking governments to stop subsidizing it. I mean, this is the most extraordinary thing that, that most livestock farming around the world is being subsidized, just like a lot of oil drilling is being subsidized. Why should we, the taxpayers, be paying our money 
to to destroy ourselves why should why should we allow our money to be used against our interests and against the interests of our children we we absolutely should stop that and that requires again a political campaign thanks lav thanks lance and, and george again as well uh so our next student is a master student in sustainability leadership and governance at his university of hong kong li xiaoming please oh hello george um i'm really happy to meet you and have this chance to ask you questions. So as introduced right now, I'm stu studying in the program of sustainability leadership and governance at HKU. But before jo joining HKU, I had been working with the United Nations Environment Program uh, for six years as a Chinese social media manager. And I had been based in Nairobi, uh, Kenya there. So, so I wanna share with you a story <laughs> first, and the story would be a bit long. Uh, so the sort of influence you had on me uh, before asking questions. So while I, while I was listening to your talks about your new book, I noticed that instead of like saying climate change, you keep saying climate breakdown. So which yeah. triggers my memory that back to like where I was with UNAP, I read an article and I translated that article into Chinese. Uh, so this was an article posted on Guardian and it was about we need new words to describe our nature and our relationships with it so we can better defend it. Uh, and I first learned the climate breakdown, this term from that article. So my intuition drove me to search for that article again. And it turns out that you are the author. Um, so the finding makes me feel really excited because that article was really an eye-opening piece to me. And I also prefer use uh, climate breakdown ever since reading that article. Uh, I'm also in favor of the ideas you propose in that article. Uh, for instance, instead of like uh, using extinction, uh, let's adopt the word uh, ecocide and stop using environment. Uh, let's use the terms such as living planet or the natural world. Uh, it was a, also a bit challenging for me at that time to translate that article into Chinese because I, I, because I wanna come up with a accurate, well also attractive Chinese equivalence to all those like new English terms. And uh, that article has was posted on the UNAP's Chinese social media platform and it got very good feedbacks at that time. So like uh, most of the Chinese people left their comments saying that uh, uh, so saying that the article provides a very special perspective and showcasing a good example of environment advocacy. And uh, people believe that these new words are really helpful to enhance the environment consciousness of, uh, of the general public. So years later, as reading your new book is once again a mind blowing experience to me. On, the, on one hand, I, I feel really excited about the breakthrough in the environmental technology, the microbial, uh, the, 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 the fermentation you introduced in your, in your new book. And I look forward to seeing it get full commercialized and further leads to the culture, social, and even political shifts across the globe. But on the other hand, it touches my nerves. As learned from your speech, it seems that we are kind of in the uh, wrong direction of what we promote. As I had been with UNAP, so UNAP covers a broad range of environmental topics and issues. And just as you said, little attention has been on, con uh, has been on the farming. And we talk a lot about the wildlife and human conflicts when it comes to the wildlife con protection or the nature conservation. We, we talk a lot about uh, the uh, a food food waste food waste mm -hmm. and um, and and I have also long believed that animal manure is good to soil mm -hmm. so uh so I think I believe that it takes time for me to absorb all the new facts you have put forward in your book maybe we are all mentally shackled by the misconceptions but uh, it seems that all these are not right now are not the mainstream narratives of the environment advocacy. So my question to you is, do you have any suggestions to improve or change the current narratives 
of environment advocacy and promotion. And what would you do to underpin your ideas and advocates with UN strategies? Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you very much, Lee. And, and that's all great to hear. Thank you. I'm, I'm really, really delighted. Um, yes, so stories and framing are absolutely crucial to environmental success. Yeah? And we've been... I think far too slow to recognize that and, and it's the same with with, with politics in, in general you know that 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 unless you can tell a good restoration story you're not going to get people onto your side now there are um a a series of basic narrative forms and people argue about how many there are there's sort of five basic plots or seven basic plots or nine basic plots but everyone seems to agree that there is that one of those is the basic plot that I call the restoration story. And it's a very familiar story. It's the Lord of the Rings story. It's the Harry Potter story. It's the Narnia story. It's the Bible story. We hear it again and again and again. And it goes like this. The, the world has been thrown into disorder by powerful and nefarious forces working against the interests of humankind. But the hero or heroes will fight those forces, overthrow them against the odds, and restore harmony to the land that that that's the basic narrative structure and it's been used hundreds of times through history by political and religious movements by people looking for for transformation and i think you could go as far as to say that unless you can tell a restoration story you are are not going to succeed in your political transformation and yet somehow many of us have kind of missed this we, we've overlooked the, the the importance of framing things within that restoration narrative and yet with the sort of issues that we're talking about it's actually really easy to do the world has been thrown into disorder boy hasn't it just been thrown into disorder you know you could you could totally see all the environmental disorder which has been created by powerful and nefarious forces well yes the oil companies the the the, the, the livestock industry all the other big businesses and, and the governments that are in their pocket, which which have been pushing us towards these, these environmental tipping points. But the hero or heroes, so, so who are they? Well, that's us, isn't it? That is the environmental campaigners. And, and, you know, we see some truly heroic people here. We'll fight those powerful and nefarious forces and against the odds, overthrow them. And, and I really think we can do this because if we understand where the tipping points lie and how to reach them. And in fact, there was a very interesting study looking at Fridays for Future, showing how up to the end of 2019, it came so close to reaching a social tipping point across Europe and fundamentally changing European politics. But then the pandemic came and we all had to go home and we've had to start all over again. So it's very frustrating, but it also shows we were so close. You know, and and you never know where the, the hope is going to come from. You know, no one would have guessed that a 15 year old Swedish girl was going to change the world. You know, it was just this this, you know, the serendipity is always there and got to be found. So the heroes can overthrow that system and restore harmony to the land. And and and, you know, we we that's that's almost the missing part of the story. You know, what does an ecological civilization look like? And. There are some some brilliant people who have begun to sketch that out, whether it's Jeremy Lent, whether uh, with his Patterning Instinct book, absolutely brilliant work, by the way. Um, Kate Rayworth with her Donut Economics. Um, I like the idea of, of, of a civilization based on private sufficiency, public luxury, so that um, we all have our own small domain, which is ours. But if we want luxury, we do it together. We create magnificent public parks and public swimming pools and public tennis courts rather than all trying to have our own swimming pools and tennis courts and art collections, which the planet just can't support. Um, and 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 so we, we tell a story as part of this restoration story of what the promised land looks like, what that harmonious situation looks like. Uh, and that's a really important part part of the story. You know, it's not a utopia. We're not talking about impossibilities. We're talking about, you know, a, a real and quite simple approaches which can create a, a harmonious, sustainable way of living. Um, but that's the, the the sort of end of the story. And we have we have to tell that part of the story, too. But again and again, what I want us to do is to frame what we're doing 
within that narrative structure, because that's what resonates with people and that's what gives people hope. Thanks, Xiaomi, uh, for sharing, sharing the story, absolutely. And thanks, George, for responding it. Uh, so maybe we can switch things up a little bit and, and do it in a more rapid fire question, make, it, uh, make, make things more uh, excited. Sorry, I, and, I'm, and, I'm and very yeah. long-winded, aren't I, Tony? I've <laughs> talked no, 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 far no. too long. <laughs> the audience are way too excited and there's so many questions waiting for you. And, and the, the, the next one we are going to Singapore right now, uh, where Chen, Chen Han is based. He's a student of food science and human nutrition at the NUS. So uh, Chen, here, here's your time. Hi, Jars. Thank you for your wonderful talk. And I have two questions for the point that precision fermentation has the potential to replace all the livestock farming. And the first one is how do you think when can precision fermentation be put into the food industry to replace most of the real meat? And the second one is that if they can totally replace real meat, will the livestock disappear from the world? Or how can we find a balance between the precision fermentation and the livestock farming? Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Shen. Thank you. So um, first off, uh, some of these products are ready to go, but they're waiting for regulatory approval. So for instance, in um, 2019, I went to Helsinki in Finland and, um, and saw uh, the company Solar Foods, which is producing a protein-rich flour, about 65% protein from a soil bacterium. Um, it's, a very, it's a simple process. Um, it produces a very good product. I ate a pancake made from it. In fact, I was the first person outside the lab in the world to eat a pancake made from microbial flour small flip for man um and um and it tasted just like a pancake it was great it was ready to go it has been ready to go ever since but they've been waiting for approval um by from the european union for for novel foods and and so that's that's the hold up at the moment that the, the technology seem see, seems to be there it's it's scaled up it can be produced uh, at low cost uh, but you have to get past that hurdle of, of of the regulators not making the decision um and in terms of livestock i mean sure there can be some livestock i mean that's if you have very very small numbers then it's not a problem and and you know in some places you can use them as proxy herbivores to create an intermediate disturbance regime in ecosystems but you know the, the, preserving the world's livestock as they are is not an aim of mine you know we kill 76 billion animals a year. I think most people are just completely unaware of the scale of this. Great majority are kept in huge steel sheds, treated appallingly. You know, here in the UK, if we treated dogs like we treat pigs, we'd be sent to prison. And yet treating pigs like that is just totally routine in our in, in, in our country. And and the same in many parts of the world as well. So so um you know the great majority of well, all I'd like to see just livestock farming come to an end, full stop. I mean, there's no there's no need for it. There's no excuse for it. It doesn't do any any earth system any good whatsoever. And we can keep a few examples of each of these breeds, you know, just in farms or you know, zoos, effectively. Um, why not? But you know, that's the conservation priority is all the millions of species which the livestock are driving to extinction. And you can't have both. You can't have all these livestock and you uh, and the millions of species which are now threatened by livestock with extinction. We have to make a choice. Great. Uh, Thank thanks. Thanks as well. Uh, lastly, we're pleased to have a secondary school student from Ireland School in Hong Kong express an interesting uh, interest in meeting George Chapman. Please go ahead and ask your final question. Hi, George. Great to meet you today. I just wanted to ask, considering all the challenges of environmentalism that you have discussed, uh, such as current costs, policies, approval or negligence from the larger population, what measures can be held that ensures the larger hospitality or culinary industry fully embraces this concept of sustainability? Thanks very much, Chapman. I, I, I think, I mean, the, the hopeful sign is that cuisines have changed very very rapidly no, not not always in a great way you know but 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 the what we see from recent history is that people are prepared to change not just the consumers but also the pe people um, delivering to them so in this country for example we were famously indifferent to food until about 
20 or 30 years ago. You know, we ate disgusting food. Everyone knew it was disgusting, but nobody seemed to care. And now we're totally obsessed with food in this country. And, and we, people are always experimenting with new meals, um, going to restaurants which are delivering novel products because they, they, they want to try out this new thing. And so we've seen this really radical and rapid change in food culture here. And the whole food industry has had to adapt to that change. And worldwide, we've seen the development of, of what's been called the global standard diet, where, where you and I might have a much more diverse diet than, for instance, our grandparents had, but we've probably got more or less the same diet, even though we're on other sides of the world. Um, so so the, the diets have become locally more diverse, but globally less diverse. And in some ways, that's a good thing because we're generally better nourished than before. In some ways, it's a bad thing. We've lost a lot of local distinctiveness um, and some very good local healthy foods um, have more or less disappeared. But what it shows is that change is possible. Global change is possible uh, because global change has already happened and it can happen again. So I, I think, you know, if we can get the regulatory hurdles out of the way, if we can um, uh, push back the power of the old industry, of the legacy industry, and if that S-curve can start to, 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 to happen, which I think it will, then the catering industry and the food industry will have to fall into line with what consumers want, just as it has had to fall into line with, 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 with the diets that we eat today. So I'm quite optimistic that that won't be a major barrier. Thank you. Thanks so much, George, and thanks so much to the students. Those were some really amazing questions. We've got a, if you have a couple more minutes, George, because we're I know we're about to hit time, but we've got a few questions from the audience which I will try to keep brief, but uh, some of them are, are good ones. Um, we have um, Adrian from Switzerland who asks about how would you envision long-term agricultural policy in the sense that we radically change subsidies from animal ag and industrial farming towards an alternative protein landscape, especially in places like Switzerland, where there's a lot of cattle farming that's traditional alpine farming, and that doesn't really lend itself to a different way to do things just because of the terrain. And of course, this could be true in many different parts of the world. So, so how do you see, how would you do it if you were in charge, I guess? Sure. So I, I don't want to set a global prescription for how it should be done, because I think, you know, it, things will be different in every country. And, and uh, in my limited experience of Switzerland, for instance, what I've seen is that, that you know, there is some um, um, sort of, you could see it as sort of conservation grazing, you know, where you've got very low numbers of livestock, high high in the Alps for just part of the year, can create these very beautiful flower meadows. But I've also seen situations in Sweden, where, in Switzerland, where you have higher concentrations of livestock, causing massive damage to those meadows because uh, they're putting down too much manure and the over fertilization kills all, all the flowers. So you could say in Switzerland, you know, yeah, you know, we like to have a little bit of that traditional uh, farming, but we don't really call it farming. You know, let, let's just call it what it is, which is, you know, let, let's preserve those meadows if we want to see those alpine meadows preserved. You know, that that's fine. That's absolutely fine. But you know, it's not really livestock farming in that it, it's the main product there is going to be the meadows. Um, but anything beyond, you know, and, and if if those were the only livestock we had on Earth, then the products would just be far too expensive for the great majority of people to 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 right. eat. So we shouldn't confuse that conservation grazing with livestock production. But in almost all cases, you know, livestock are just doing phenomenal damage to Earth systems, and and so it's just crazy that we're putting money into it. You know, I'm perfectly happy for sort of case by case situations where we have a very, very tiny number of cows, for instance, who um, with very closely regulated grazing to produce certain conservation outcomes. But one of the tricks of the livestock industry is to confuse that situation with meat or dairy production. And they're completely different situations. So so let's not get right. too tangled up in that. Right, um, but but so let me follow up with Arista and S. Carcatus, they have a question. How do we integrate farmers, fishermen, 
you know, how do we bring these folks into the New York Revolution? Because obviously farming remains, you know, the main job of most people on earth, you know, outside of urban elite cities. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, uh, most people on earth now live in cities. Um, and and that, I mean, it's true that um, very large numbers of people are still engaged in farming, probably around two billion around the world. And it's absolutely essential that they do not lose their livelihoods. Um, so a, a lot of the small farmers are outside the market economy altogether. They're subsistence farmers um, or are serving very strictly local markets. And so these changes are, are going to have very little impact on them, but they're already threatened to a very great extent by other changes taking place in in the world of agriculture. And we should be helping to defend those small farmers. You know, we, we don't want it all to be captured by land grabbers and, and vast corporations. Um, and so while we've been talking almost entirely about livestock, you know, we still need to produce arable crops. We still need to produce fruit and vegetables. And there are some um, very interesting new techniques which can raise yields without uh, while reducing impacts and 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 a lot of those techniques can be rolled out in an agro agroecological fashion by small farmers but you know when you look at meat production or milk production it's almost all in the hands of huge farms and huge corporations now and so we we that's what we address you know and we, we 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 have to strike at, at those ends of the industry where the major damage is being done. Absolutely. Well, there's, there's a follow-up question in here around, um, as a journalist, you know, what is your duty to, Arista's asking, to hold accountable this new technology? And, and, and I'll add in that, you know, there's been a big hullabaloo in the industry with a Bloomberg article decrying that plant-based meat is a fad. Um, and and you know the the defensiveness from the part of, of journalists that 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 write those articles is you know the industry can't take critiques and it should be critiqued just like anything else. So how do you find the balance between kind of the healthy critiques and a responsibility to move us to an alternative way of producing food that is safe and, and sustainable and nutritious? Mm -hmm. Well, so my, my feeling is that. You know, I, I just have to try to tell the truth and I have to try to winnow the facts and see what's true and what's false. And you know, there's so many falsehoods, there's so much misinformation out there. And I don't have any loyalty to any particular industry or to any particular approach. But the ones uh, that I, I'm promoting at the moment are the ones which I think are going to be most useful. Now, if that changes, I will change change my mind accordingly. Um, uh, of course, at the moment, there will be a bumpy ride for these alternative products because we're at the bottom of the S-curve. It's always bumpy. There's always setbacks and there's always people writing scare stories and, and saying, oh, oh, well, they thought that was going to happen, but it didn't. They said the same about the electric light bulb. You know, it's 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 it's, it, it's a constant issue. Um, there was when televisions first came onto the scene. In, in the UK, there was an article published where a man said, um, any product whose name is a fusion of Greek and Latin is bound for failure. <laughs> so, so I think, you know, I think we should be taking these critiques with a pinch of salt. Sure, but how do we ensure that it doesn't go from big meat to big old protein? Right. Oh, sure. Well, no, that that's a that's an absolutely uh, real and genuine problem, um, largely because of the you know the capital investment required. So, what exactly. we need in this field, as in every other field, is strong antitrust laws and weak intellectual property rights. But as a result of corporate lobbying over the past few decades, we've ended up with weak antitrust laws and strong intellectual property rights. These are political decisions that have been made by people and people can and must reverse them. Okay, um, one last question by Mark Harper about the green premium. Um, how worried are you that the cost of living crisis will, will impact the implementation of this vital new food agenda, given that there's an often incorrect view that sustainable products come with you know, a more expensive price tag. Sure. Well, the, the the novel foods we're talking about, they will win on cost. If they're going to win, they will win on cost because they will come in as cheaper than animal agriculture. And that shouldn't be difficult when you consider the enormous infrastructural costs of animal agriculture, as well as all the huge environmental costs, which the industry doesn't pay and the rest of society has to. You know, it should be 
easy for the new products to be cheaper than that it's subsidies and 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 the the regulatory barriers which which are much more likely to 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 get in the way um so i i don't think that the cost of living crisis is is an inherent barrier um because actually this will help people um you know not immediately because these products are still quite expensive but but when the price comes right down as it will that'll help people who are facing a cost of living crisis it's much more to do with the political barriers than the economic ones and those are the ones that need to be addressed thank you so much george that was incredible um i will hand it over to justin dr justin over to you Thank you, Sonali. One second. I'm just going to put some slides up and remove George from the profile for a second and spotlight myself. Okay, um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, just as a final few words, um, I hope you can see the screen. I had some notes here. Um, just one second. Let me uh, print that. Okay, first thing I'd like to say is, I mean, a, a plug for uh, George's book. Please support um, your local bookstore. Univer university bookstores are carrying Regenesis. And of course, you can find, um, you can find it online as well. Um, if you're still getting to know George's work, um, I, I wanted to recommend um, a couple of pieces. The first is a Guardian piece from 2008. Um, you know, it's a model Monbiot piece. It, it has that image for you uh, that stays in your head. He speaks of a prominent environmentalist who proudly uh, proclaims that they bought king prawns and turned down um, using a plastic bag. And that person failed to see the disconnect, the larger disconnect in that action. Um, then George goes on to, to tell us about you know, the problems of emphasizing personal choice in response to the environmental crisis. And then you've got to love the language of micro-consumerist bollocks, which just rolls off the tongue, um, plastic straws chief among them. And then this piece um, calls for action on a more syst systemic level, challenges us to think of new ideas, to push against corporate and political power, and to do this within social movements. And then the second piece you see in front of you um, is George's, one of George's most recent articles on COVID. Um, worryingly, he finds the science convincing that each successive COVID infection that we get can lead to worse physical outcomes. Um, he then rightly explains that the project of bringing better air to schools is urgent and incomplete, showing us that you know, air quality is a function of class and power. For students, I would recommend that you take a look at George's website where he has a um, uh, one piece that speaks about his advice to students. Well worth a read. Lastly, for those interested in Sonali who don't know her, of course, you can head to the Green Queen website. You also might look out for her recent LinkedIn missive uh, where she was responding to this recent wave of critical pieces about consumer acceptance of plant-based foods. Let me read one line especially. Pretending that the average person is confronted between a choice of regenerative grown pasture fed beef patty versus a processed plant based meat patty is wrong, reductive, ignorant, and elitist. It's almost a perfect debate motion for one of my classes. So thank you for that, Sonali. Lastly, we have um, some ideas for the remaining parts in the food series. So please stay in touch with Tony, Sonali, and myself, and we'd love to hear more from you. Over to Tony to say the final thank you. Thank you once again for everybody who've joined us today. Uh, I know it's people around the world are joining us, so please stay tuned for our next event. Thank you once again deeply, uh, George, for having us and sharing your insights. We absolutely will keep track of your, your social media accounts. And if there's any book coming up, we'd love to, to have you again uh, with us. Uh, thank you again. Thank you very much. It's been a total pleasure. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Sonali, Justin, and, and, and all the participants. It was really great to talk to you. Thanks, George. Have a nice day. And you. Bye, everyone. Bye.